I know. I'm sorry. Sometimes I forget. And then, then I remember at the end, I'm like, man, that was a good session. And then it's all for nuts, but it was still was a good session for the people that attended. So mindfully read the scenario and the questions analyze for keywords and phrases that pop out. Is it a special population? You know, what grade level, what time, you know, did they give me a time marker? Is it the first time we're using a strategy? Is it at the beginning of the year? Is it the beginning of class? What, when is it happening? Read it mindfully, analyzing for those keywords and phrases. Identify the goal in the scenario. Say the question in layman's terms, and then make sure you give each answer choice due process and that you're measuring the answer choice against the keywords and phrases we identified or that you identified, because it has to attend. This is a critical reading exam. They're all critical reading exams. Yes, they are assessing your knowledge of trade PPR, but it's also an assessment of your ability to critically read. Can you really see what they're asking and, and you know, get through the tricks? So let's see if we can. We have teachers in a career and technical education program want to promote student success as they progress through increasingly rigorous coursework. Which of the following actions by the teacher could be most effective in promoting this outcome? So let's begin. We read mindfully the scenario in question, and now we need to analyze for keywords and phrases and identify the goal. So what, what is the goal here? What are we doing and what keywords and phrases should we pay attention to? Promote student success and uh, maybe increasing rigorous uh, coursework. Yeah, I think so too. So the goal is to promote student success, right? Mm -hmm. In their course coursework as it gets increasingly rigorous. Okay, so... The question is saying, which of the following actions by the teacher would be most effective in promoting this outcome? And the outcome is we want student success. We want to promote student success in increasingly, what does rigorous mean? Rigorous coursework. Like hard work or something? Yes. We want to mm -hmm. help support, promote student success as the coursework gets more hard. What would be the best way of doing that? Supporting, promoting our student success as they go through increasingly, it's going to increase and get ever more difficult as they progress. So let's take a look at these answer choices. Um, assigning students in advanced classes to, oh, wait, one more thing before I move on. When they say most, when you see most, mm -hmm. most appropriate, most effective, most beneficial, the test writer is using that word because they have given you possibly more than one effective way of doing this. But one is more effective, the most effective based on the specifics that they've told us, right? So whenever you see the word most in your question, that should just like make the hairs stand up and you should already tell yourself, I'm going to have, I'm going to be between two answer choices at the end. And one is going to be better based on the specifics I identified. So we have assigning students in advanced classes to mentor students in introductory classes. Implementing individual exit tickets with students at the end of each of their courses. Ensuring that the curriculum is aligned vertically to minimize instructional gaps. Participating in joint instructional planning with colleagues who teach related courses. Okay, so we went through all of them. I want for you to see if you can find one and you're like, I'm going to bet myself that's not the right answer and this is why. Which one is not, you said? Yeah, like, yeah we're going to do all the knots first. We're going to yeah. process of elimination it out. So remember, maybe it'll be easier if I write our goal, although you won't be able to do that then. But the goal is support students as they move. Wait. towards more difficult courses, right? Mm -hmm. The best way to support our students as they move towards more difficult courses. So what about implementing individual exit interviews with students at the end of each of their courses? Would this support them as they move towards more difficult courses? 
Mm, not really. No. No. Just having a conversation with them at an exit interview is like, how did you like the class? What did you find difficult with it? What are your goals for later? That's an exit interview. And they're great. They're they're fantastic. And they sh they are helpful, um, especially if that student is going to be in another, you know, more advanced portion of your class next year. Important. However, this will not um, in any way um help promote their success as they move to a more difficult another you know level of course where it's more difficult that conversation is not going to take any effect um as far as helping them so this is not the right answer and we can bet ourselves five dollars that it's not what mm -hmm. else and make sure that you read the answer choices carefully because i'm going to show you an example of where they give you a, uh, an answer choice and it seems like it, it might be good but if you read it carefully it's like like a shiny turd it's not at all a good choice so let's <laughs> take a look at d participating in joint instructional planning with colleagues all good up until then right right but yeah. who teach related courses what does related courses mean is it the same course as you similar maybe Maybe similar, related, similar, but would planning with different, because it's not the same, or just a related course, planning with them help your students understand more difficult coursework in your area? Yeah. Would it? Mm -mm. Not really. No, because it's, uh, you're not guaranteed that it's the same, like what you're learning. Right, I'll give you an example. Different. Yeah, I'll give you an example. So let's say that I am an English language arts and reading teacher, and it gets more difficult as you move from English one to English four, right? And it's going to get way more difficult when they get to English four AP. And I need to make sure that they're able to be successful as they progress through this getting more difficult coursework. Would it be beneficial for me to like plan with the math and history teachers to try to get them to do better in my English four class? Mm -hmm. No, it wouldn't make any sense. That's not gonna help them be more successful. It's not even the same course. They're not even like in my subject area. And right now we're not talking about getting them to be better cross-curricular thinking. That's not the goal. The goal is for them within my own content, within, within career and technical education, I, I it's gonna get harder. And I need within that one, to help ensure and help them. So planning with another, a related colleague, while that is good practice to help them see how there's connections between all of the subject, it is not going to help with the goal. The goal is to support students as they move towards more difficult courses within career and tech technical education, not in a related course. So D for sure is not the answer. We're left with A and C, and we knew we would be because it says, most effective Most. right mm -hmm. so there we have assigning students in advanced classes to mentor students in introductory classes not a bad um practice in fact i would probably do it however there is another answer choice that is best as far as being most effective to make sure they have all of the knowledge concepts and skills necessary to enter the more rigorous coursework which would be which one? C. C. Absolutely. So while A is not a bad answer, it would be, you You can help them. Obviously having advanced kids mentor the introductory, they can help them and say, listen, uh, make sure you pay attention. Let's say it's like medical terminology. Make sure you pay attention to medical terminology because it's going to come into like really when you're in the advanced classes, you need to be able to know that it needs to be like automatic. So that information could be helpful to, to help promote. But the one that is absolutely most effective is ensuring that the curriculum is vertically aligned. So that the um, seventh graders that take a class get the knowledge, concepts, and skills necessary for them to be able to move to eighth grade and do a little bit more difficult. And in eighth grade, we teach them the particular knowledge, concepts, and skills 
so that in the ninth grade, and it vertically aligns to minimize those gaps in learning for them. It's those gaps in learning that makes it difficult for them to, to keep up with the rigorous coursework. So solidifying our vertical alignment of that content area and vertical means that you're going from for for the purposes of your exam, you're going to be going from uh, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh grade, twelfth grade. So vertically aligning so that the sixth graders get the knowledge, concepts, and skills necessary for them to be able to succeed in seventh grade, and so on and so forth. So that by the time they get to twelfth grade, which is going to be crazy rigorous coursework. It's easy peasy lemon squeezy because we vertically align so well to build and scaffold on all our knowledge and skills. Yep. How are we? I had chosen letter C. <laughs> Yay, that's yep. wonderful. Fantastic. I'm just gonna take a picture of this little deal. Okay, you did. And then clear it. Competency two. So competency one was about your knowledge um, of instructional development that builds coherently towards objectives based on state standards, course content, and expected student outcomes. So that was competency one. Competency two is about resources, technologies, and materials. How you select, adapt, incorporate resources and technologies to help promote success in learning. Remember, we discussed the universal design for learning. Correct, Adolfo? Yes. And it's my favorite. And the reason it's my favorite is because it does such a good job of like thinking of all of the things I need to think, like making sure I provided multiple means for representation, multiple means for action, um, and, and that I've chosen more than one uh, resource to help illustrate whatever concept I'm trying to teach my students, right? And technology really has made it so, like so much easier for us. When I started teaching in 2003, we did not have the internet and it just was really hard to help. I mean, to try to explain things and ideas <laughs> without the use of um, the internet, you know, it's sort of, it was like this magic unlocker of, of, visuals like we could show them now what we meant and that's really important especially for the younger age groups where they are unable to um abstract which means they can't think of concepts that they haven't seen or or witnessed or understood before um so so being able to show them and and not having to leave the abstraction up to them which they can't do is invaluable so let's take a look at this one. Miss Gabby, can you read number three for me? And then I want you to go through the, and I'll highlight at the keywords and phrases you tell me. Okay. Number three, in a principal level career and tech technical education class, the teacher plans to engage students in project-based learning experience that will involve extensive use of technology. Students have a district provided one-to-one provided -one ele what is it? electronic device and technical support. The teacher is working with the technology department to plan and implement the project. Which of the following issues is most important to consider in the planning process? Okay, thank you so much. So we're in a principal levels career and technology education class. So what does that mean, principals levels, in a principal's levels? When you, yeah, you start? Yeah, yeah, and that's important to note, right? And they didn't tell you in a beginning career, blah, blah, blah. They, they told you in fancy vernacular, right? Fancy vocabulary. But it's in a beginning class. We have this teacher plans to engage students, project-based learning. And remember, uh, Adolfo, I told you yesterday, one of my favorite, like, and I witnessed it as a teacher, um, Pro Project-based learning was the architecture and construction. Uh, it was the woodshop teacher, and he had the students uh, do this project-based learning experience where they built podiums uh, for the English department and different groups of like uh, triads, like three. They were in groups of three came and you know uh, sort of did like a a customer's interview where they asked, like, you know, they took measurements, how tall are you? Like, what sort of things do you like your interest? Because they also decorated it and, and added little special touches. Each one, each podium for the English department was different based on, you know, what 
The teacher had told the students what the students had created and imagined for them. So it was really, really cool. They did a lot of math. They did a lot of listening, speaking, reading, and writing. They just did so much. And so within that one project, there was so much knowledge. And that knowledge did, didn't just remain in the trade. It was math, science. It was English language arts. It was like customer service. It was an amazing project. So I really like project-based learning experiences. So I'm a fan. And they always engage students. Like, I mean, if if you tell them, okay, guys, you're going to go and here's your assigned English teacher. You got to go and interview her, blah, blah, blah. The students are like ready and they're excited and it just gets them uh, out of the worksheets type learning experience. So uh, that will involve extensive use of technology. What does extensive use of technology mean in layman's terms? like longer um like a lot of use a lot a lot of use so guys they're in a beginner level career technology education they're gonna engage in a project-based learning experience and it's gonna involve extensive use of technology important information students Mm -hmm. have district provided one to one electronic devices and technical support Mm -hmm. each student and remember this is a a theoretical exam so in theory every single district should have everything that they need every classroom has everything they need so the for the purposes of this exam you're never going to have to have students share or you don't have the technology or the equipment or the materials to do it that's never the right answer it is utopia isd what we have experienced as limitations in reality keep them out of this exam for sure, because we don't have limitations on this exam. So we have students have district provided one-to-one devices and one-to-one technical support. That's an important, you know, detail in this scenario. The student is working with the technology department to plan and implement the project. Now, the question is asking us, following issues which are the following issues and here's that most word Mm -hmm. again most important to consider in the planning process so we're looking for an issue what is an issue that we should consider like what issue might and I would say that like if it's a principal level career in technology I would have been nervous that they're going to use extensive use of technology but the next sentence said that they have not only one-to-one devices but they also have technical support so that's really helpful and that that issue that I already had in my head was sort of alleviated with that sentence that came after there was an issue (laughs) because if we're principals we're in a beginner class you're going to use extensive stuff I'm thinking there's going to be lots of issues however the next sentence told me that that they have technical support. So what I thought was an issue in my mind is no longer an issue, but we need to figure out which one of these is still an issue. So putting in place steps to facilitate students' equitable access to and support in using technology during the process and during the project, designing the project with flexibility and requirements for (laughs) students who do not have ready access to technology, Acquiring user guides and tutorials specific to available technology for students to reference during the project. Ensuring that technology students will utilize, ensuring that the technology students will utilize during the project is approved by school and district uh, administrators. Okay, what can we get rid of? D, I think, because they already have the school district provides one-to-one electronics, so. So which one? I say D. Oh, D, insurance students with utilize product is approved, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're planning it with the technology department. What's, like, we're planning it with the technology. I don't think they're going to agree. Like, we're we're working with them in the planning and implementation, so. I think if we were going to use something that isn't approved, technology department would jump in real quick. 
So I would say D is not it too. But what about this one, B, designing the project with flexibility and requirements for students who do not have ready access to technology? That's going to be provided to, to them. them. Right. That's not even a thing. It's not even a thing. <laughs> no, it's not a thing because it's going to be providing for them. Available technology for students. I, uh, C. C? We, see out oh, because you're gonna have technical support there um right. and, gonna have the and you think mm -hmm. principal level students are gonna be able to do just with the user guides i think they're gonna be oh yeah just read the user guides and you'll be fine guys like go figure it out yourself no students have access to one-to-one -one electronic and technical support but maybe putting in steps to facilitate that's like, okay, if you need help, then you need to email, like having steps in place so that everybody has equal access to the technical support during the project, that they know the steps that they can take, that they're easy and, 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 and they make it to where everyone has access to one-to-one -to -one support. <laughs> Because this is not saying like putting steps in place to make sure they get technical support. We already know that they get technical support, but if yeah. everyone's doing it, there needs to be steps put in place for them to get that and for, to make sure that like, you know, everybody has access to it. It's equal access, equal time for that support because they're going to need it. We're a principal's class and you're using extensive technology. So clearly a lot of people are going to need use of one-to-one, -one, right, supports. So making sure that we facilitate, that we have steps in place to facilitate equitable access, like maybe a sign-up sheet, maybe an I like a Google Drive login list, that, and then the support person gets to you, but to where everyone has uh, the steps in place that they can use to access that support. Well done, guys. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Adolfo, would you like to read for us number four? Yes, uh, an, indigen sorry. Uh, an engineering teacher incorporates various strategies into instruction. For example, the teacher presents new content orally along with a, uh, appropriate? appropriate graphics support. However, Whenever possible, the teacher provides students with manipulatives, material, and tools to use in problem solving. At the end of each class, the teacher has students work with a partner to respond to a discussion question prompt, focusing on the topic of the day session lesson. The teacher approaches approach can be expected to enhance students' ability in which of the following areas. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So what keywords and phrases as the reading went on did you see that you said like, oh, okay, this is important? Incorporate better uh, strategies into instruction. Mm -hmm. Teacher presents new content orally. Orally with graphic support. So oral and we have the graphic support. Manipulative, manipulative materials. Manipulative materials and tools. tools. What else? Do you see a time marker? At the end of each class. Thank you. At the end of each class, the teacher has students work with partners. They respond to discussion question, prompt focusing on the topic of the day's lesson. So they have a question that they respond to. And this is one of my favorite things to do because it's a great way of extending wait time, just like in a really ridiculous way where you give them the poignant discussion question and they write down the response. And then you say, okay, turn to your partner, think, pair, share. And like I discussed with you yesterday, they get to negotiate in a risk-free activity um, 
the the knowledge right and and gain understanding uh, of whatever mistakes or misconceptions within that little and then come back and they're able to discuss it with the whole class if you go back to a um you know a group setting um but i love love think pair shares they are the best way to get everyone to participate in a low risk activity where they practice oral language proficiency, where they're talking about academic specific concepts, and that's what we want for them to do. So um, the teacher's approach can be expected to enhance students' abilities in the following areas. So the goal for us is like the teacher's approach can be expected. So her approach to teaching is going to do what? How will it and what area will it help support the students or enhance their understanding. So let's read through. We have personal responsibility for learning, conceptual understanding, connection of content to life experiences, or D, use of academic language. I don't think C. Yeah, I don't think C2. We don't have anything in there about connection. Like they didn't mention that at all, that it was in any way a connection to life experiences. So we can bet ourselves $5. That's not the correct answer. What else? This is a very tricky question. Yeah. D? D what? Uh, use, uh, let me see. If it's a group, can it be a personal responsibility for learning or can it be like, this is supposed to be like with a group, like that's the wrong answer. Right. I think it's the right answer. There's nothing in there that says the student has to take personal responsibility for learning. Like there's, I don't see anything in there. Like we, we get several and, and remember guys, the, the question is like the teacher's approach. There's not just one approach they gave us. They gave us various strategies that she yeah. so she's has she uses oral with graphic support she provides manipulative materials and tools to use when they're problem solving and then at the end she provides them an opportunity to think pair share with their partners based on the topic of the lesson so what it what is she trying to strengthen what is she enhancing their abilities with utilizing all of them and they gave you some of these to be tricky but I think she's, she wants the students to learn alone, but also in partners. Like, um, I, I think. For sure. So which area was she likely to enhance? We have left personal responsibility for learning. Do you think that she's enhancing that, their personal responsibility? I think so. I don't know. Is she doing that? Is, does she ha have them like, write down or um you know what they learned and no. assess it i think that one's out the personal responsibility for yeah i think it is out. out it is out it's definitely yeah. out and when they said um you know that, that definitely they wanted us to be left with these two answers. So there's nothing mm -hmm. about personal responsibility. There's nothing about connections to life experiences in here. There is help with conceptual understanding and there is use of academic language. Both of these things are taking place. One is better than the other. I think the correct answer is B. <laughs> The correct answer is B. Uh, D is being done in this last part here where she has the students work with a partner and respond to it. Like that helps them use academic language, right? Because they're going to have to use the the vocabulary that was in the, the topic for the day's lesson. But it's not everything. She is doing all of these things in an effort to build the students' conceptual knowledge their knowledge and understanding of the concepts that she's doing. That's why she does orally with graphic, with manipulatives. That's why she, at the end of class, does this, where they get to partner. It is to enhance the student's conceptual understanding, the understanding of the concept that is the focal point of the lesson. Good job, guys. 
that one was hard. That academic language one is there to was there to like super tricky because if you know anything about practicing academic language, this last bit the teacher's doing, think pair share on a discussion question, focusing on the topic, that is an excellent way to get native English speakers to practice you know, speaking, using academic language and our ELL. So I use it all the time because it's an invaluable tool for many reasons, conceptual. And it also does help, you know, with the use of it helps with conceptual understanding as well. But it also helps with the use of academic vocabulary. So. But do you see how they try to be tricky on purpose? Mm hmm. It's unfortunate. Okay, so this is about data-driven practices and student assessments. I want for you to always remember and hear my voice saying, when you hear or see the word assessments, I want for you to think measuring, collection of data. An assessment is not just something we do so we can put it in a grade book. We collect data so that we could better plan for instruction, so that we know what you, what you need and what you're good with already. So let's take a look at uh, number five. Gabby, you want to read this one? Yes, ma'am. Which of the following scenarios most clearly represents a teacher's use of informal assessment to guide instruction? All right. What keywords and phrases do we see? Most clearly. Right. That should raise the hairs on us because we already know there might be more than one, most clearly, but what? A use of informal assessment to guide instruction. To guide instruction. Informal assessment means collection of data. So we want, because we're going to put it in layman's terms, remember, which of the following scenarios, which of the scenarios shows us the teacher collecting data to guide instruction, period. Collecting data to guide instruction. Informal assessment is a, is a collection of data. That's me walking through the classroom during cooperative learning groups and listening to them analyze po a poem and hearing that three out of the five groups are off totally and me being like, mm, that's an informal assessment. I just gathered a whole bunch of data and now I'm going to go to the front of the class and say, okay, guys, it seems like some of us are confused. Let's do this poem together and identify. I'm going to bring it right back. That's me being a responsive instructor because I already gave an informal assessment. They don't even know about it. All I did was walk around and listen that they didn't have it. And now I'm going to reteach. So this question is asking us, which one is the most obvious use of collection of data to guide instruction, to drive instruction? And that's what uh, formative assessments, they help form our instruction. And we have informal formative assessments and we have formal formative assessments, but they always form and guide instruction. So let's read these answer choices. You want to read them for me, Gabby? Yes, a, uh, the teacher includes content that has been addressed on previous classroom tests on subsequent tests. B, the teacher implements regular written tests to measure students' mastery of specific content and standards. C, the teacher provides immediate feedback to students during lesson activities and class assignments. And D, the teacher uses, uses very uh, question strategies in the moment to check students' understanding of lesson content. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's take a look at these and see if we can, uh, you know, just sort of get rid of some. Get rid of A. Right, so the teacher includes content that has been addressed on previous classroom tests. And so how is that most clear? Like it's not. It, a, we can bet ourselves $5. That is not the right answer. Thing D, you can get rid of it too. Uses varied questioning strategies in the moment to check understanding of lesson content. Oh. <laughs> no, I think we can leave that one. I don't know. Okay, which one can we get rid of for sure though? Mm -hmm. Remember, we're looking for an informal assessment. It was That's just like a just a collection of data B. a regular written test is that formal or no. informal that would be formal. formal it is formal so it cannot be the right answer like we already know it goes it's the antithesis of one of our keywords so it can never be the right answer that is a formal assessment and and so no so now we're left with the two 
providing immediate feedback to students during lesson activities and class assignments, or using varied questioning strategies in the moment to check students' understanding of lesson content. D is I would think D. the answer. I think the D is the answer. I don't know. Use informal assessments. That's the way you can ask the student. Right. That is you're you're asking them, checking for understanding, but remember represents a teacher's use of informal assessment to guide instruction. Oh, so we, okay. we need that second part is guiding instruction. That's when you give feedback. Right. So, so which so, one is better based on what they said to us? Because they're both fine. They're both good. They're both things you would absolutely do. Absolutely. So you eliminate D and the correct answer will be C. That is correct. Those. Yeah. Providing that immediate feedback and redirecting during the lesson activities mm -hmm. is you guiding instruction. You changed it and you guided instruction in a different direction based on whatever informal uh, assessments you did. You got it. Excellent uh, job, guys. That one was tricky. Mm -hmm. That one was tricky. And that's because it's a short, like a short, short question. Yeah, there's no scenario or anything like that. It's just a little... And mo most of the questions are going to be like that. Sorry to ask. No, yeah, they they will for sure. Okay, let's read this one. A career and technical education teacher incorporates frequent formative assessments into instruction and makes anecdotal notes of student participation in class and small groups. The teacher also assigns one project-based activity to cooperative groups and provides a rubric for evaluating the project. This multi-pronged approach is likely to be effective in achieving which of the following goals. So let's go back. Let's look for keywords and phrases. What are we looking for? What do we got? Um, incorporate frequent formative assessments. Right. Which we said assessment is like a collection of data. Right. And formatives help form. Formatives can be both formal and they can be informal. It could be an essay that I have you write or a test I have you take, or it could just be me listening to you talking in your group. That's also an informal assessment. Um, so she incorporates and or uses frequent formative assessments into instruction. And there's an and. She makes um, anecdotal notes. What does anecdotal mean? Um, An anecdotal means like what your observations, like what you experienced. Uh, so it's like a story. So she is just during the lesson, what she experiences of the student's participation in class or in small groups makes notes. Like anecdotal would be Miss Salceda, you know, bow guarded or like monopolize the conversation like that's an anecdotal note it's evidence from based on her observations and her experience you know watching it take place so she also assigns one project-based activity to cooperative groups and she provides a rubric for evaluating the project this multi-pronged approach is likely to be Here's the most word, most effective in achieving which of the following goals. So we're looking for a goal. Like what goal will she achieve by giving frequent data collection, right? Collecting data all the time, um, making anecdotal notes of student participation and assigning this um, project-based learning experience with the rubric, which is so important and literally best practice. So let's, uh, can you read those answer choices for me? A, determining the most important, appropriate instructional strategies for individual students. B, gaining a full picture of students learning on which to base instructional decisions. 
C, providing students with a summary of their progress and learning, and D, preparing students for the very tasks that are likely to encounter in the workplace. All right, so we're looking for the, what goal they're achieving. That's the question that they're asking. Like most effective, this multi-pronged approach to the teaching, what is it gonna achieve for our students? Determining the most appropriate instructional strategies for individual students, gaining a full picture of student learning on which to base instructional decisions, providing students with a summary of their progress and preparing students for the very tasks they are likely to encounter in the workplace. So what can we get rid of right away and bet ourselves, bet ourselves it is not the right answer? D. Yeah, I don't see anything here about the Working. workplace. None of it. Mm -mm. And let me just say, based on the scenario, it is always best practice for you to provide a rubric. If you have something that is going to be difficult for you to grade or difficult for you to like, or you need particular things to happen in order for mastery to take place, then you need to provide a rubric. Very easy to read set of expectations for passing and for failure, not just for the students to know, you know, what, how is it that I, I do a good job on this, but also um, to protect yourself when you're grading these things, because a parent might come to you and say, why did my son get a 65 on this project? And you will have the rubric to say, this is the rubric that we, that we went over before we started the project. And you'll see that in these three categories, there's no points, you know, so you can justify yourself, but also, and more importantly, so that the students know where to go, what the expectation is and how to achieve mastery. So what, um, what else, what else can we, you know, sort of get away with or do away with? A. A, you want to eliminate? Because you want to. I want to eliminate it too, if you want to. Yeah. Um, I don't think that, the, you know, giving the formative assessments, um, the anecdotal, well, maybe, let's see, for individual students. I just don't think, I, I don't know. Well, I, I, I don't think. I think that that's a good answer. One of the good answers. I think so too, because remember, she's also yeah, taking, just, the teachers mm -hmm. also taking the anecdotal evidence of individual students, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. She is watching them individually, not just in their class or small groups. She's thinking of, I think, um, the needs of students individually. And that's why she's taking the notes. So I wouldn't, Eliminate A either just yet. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so. uh, maybe C. I'm not. I don't know. Yeah. Is she providing a full summary of their progress and learning to them? Huh. No, she's using that information. For herself, right? Mm -hmm. This one's a very difficult one. I would say both A and D are good, but remember, one is more based on the specifics that we have. I would say B because she's uh, writing her notes. Um, She's doing like a couple of things. Right. At the same time. To base a decision. Uh, I don't know. So I mean, B is the correct answer? Uh, I we, say, don't know. we don't know yet, but I say B is the correct answer because look, look, determining the most appropriate instructional strategies, instructional strategies. Is she doing that? Is she like going and saying, does this instructional strategy work for this individual student? No. No. I don't think so. 
I think that B is the best answer. But I, I didn't want to overall. I think overall, it's... exactly overall. It says, and it says they're gaining a full picture of the students learning. Exactly, it. exactly. exactly. Excellent, guys. Remember, this is a reading exam. Reading, like, between the lines is not one of those things. You just read the words that are there, like the keywords and phrases that are there. So let's take a look at this one. This is still on pedagogy. Domain two is about your students. A culinary teacher who wishes to encourage students need for self-actualization as defined in Maslow's hierarchy of needs should emphasize that students remain, wait, should emphasize that students remain motivated because they, so a culinary teacher who wishes to encourage self-actualization. And if we go back to my handy dandy cheat sheet, you'll see self-actualization is the highest level. Um, so what should she emphasize? What should the culinary arts teacher emphasize in order so that the students remain motivated. Wishes to encourage students need for self-actualization. Mm -hmm. so let's take a look at the answer choices. A, are more likely than, are more likely to get good high paying job if they succeed in school. Benefit from striving to realize their full potential and achieve a self, a sense of accomplishment. A part of a team along with their teacher and other students will find school less stressful if they follow the rules and expectations of others. So we want to find what's the best way to encourage self-actualization. What should we emphasize to the students? Their full potential. <laughs> right. I would say B. I think A is not the right answer. They don't need to emphasize high paying jobs if you succeed in school. Um, and self-actualization means you, you do it for yourself, not for anyone else, like for yourself, because you feel good because I achieved something that's self-actualization. I learned this not because it was for a grade, but I was interested in it and it went and I did that self-actualization. So yes, um, C and D are not the right answer. And B is the only one that has them that self-actualization sense of accomplishment. And that's what we have here. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, we're gonna go ahead and end here, but we'll we'll get together and do some uh some more of these. And um next time we're gonna get into the specifics of the essay skeleton. Okay. Nice. Thank you. Is this will this be uh when like on, on Fridays? I, I mean I think I have uh you test on Saturday, is that correct? I do. You do, you test on Saturday. Yeah. And um, let's take a look while we're here, um, just before you go. The, yeah, I have trade PPR classes Monday through Friday. So you could just, if you sign up for one, um, <clears throat> the class is made. So I'm going to just show you before you leave here. Remember I told you that because the trade exam has so many different content areas in there, like culinary arts, architectural, law enforcement, all of the different ones, they can't ask you anything specific to your trade that are in your mm -hmm. teeks, but they can ask from the teeks that have, like there are certain teeks about uh, workplace ethics and expectations that are the same for all of the trade and industry. Those are the teaks you're going to get as an example to use for your exam. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, for instance, the one that they give you here, student discusses worth ethics, employer expectations, interactions with diverse populations, and communication skills in the workplace. So, you have to come up with an objective for this. There's so many things. How many, like, characteristics of, of of workplace ethics can you think of that you could do a lesson about and I always use the one about punctuality because it's like the most easy like all you did was show up but you have to show up on time and so uh one of the ways that you can um you know 
prepare in advance is to think of some of those ideas and lessons that you might set up for them and things that you could do to help them understand the importance. And if we go to the, um, okay, so here's health science. I'm gonna get out of here and go to, these are our teaks. And as I told y'all, like career development, career and technical education here, are all the different kinds. So we have agriculture, food, human resources, manufacturing, marketing, energy, finance. Um, law, public service. So let's take a look at the public principles of law. So they're not going to ask you any questions about this on your exam. It's all going to be pedagogy related, but there are skills that are necessary. So uh, differentiate speaking strategies used to communicate specific ideas to various audiences. Um, let me see where I'm looking for. Not the court system looking for the do, 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 fire protective. Okay, so there's this one does. Oh, yeah. Effective interpersonal skills necessary to communicate with coworkers. Ethical issues. So, um, correction services. So for like all of them are going to have a skill of like verbal communication, right? Communicating in your trade and industry. So that could be used as a teak for your, for, um, you know, writing up. Like the one they gave me for practice was uh, knowledge and skill. And then he said, uh, the student demonstrates professional employability skills to gain a level entry position. Right, right. So employability skills. So interview skills, communication skills, resume skills. You could do a lesson on resume building where they have to go to each like different section. So um, they're gonna ask you about concepts that are found among all trades and all yes. industries, yeah. And, and then the thing, the thing was uh, on the letter was D and it said interview skills. So we talk more about how to build the resume, how to do an interview, and what else did I put on my practice? Because I think something about um, basically that was it: how to do an interview and how to conduct an interview, being on time. And dress up. What else did I put above the resume? I talk about those three things, I think. Excellent. So what I want for you to do next time is to just focus on one. And then think, so let's just say like, um, let's take professional dress, right? So like employability, uh -huh. like interview skills, like professional dress. And you could do a gallery walk where you printed out pictures of humans in different dress, right? And you you gave them a job, uh, what is it called? Description where they put like what you need, to, what you're going to, job responsibilities are going to do, what like information or not information, like education the person has to have. And so you give them the, you know what, when you're going to hire, what is it called? I can't think of what it is. Like your job expectations or like your, when you're applying. Yeah. yeah. So have them have those and walk around to the different gallery viewings of people in different dress and, and look at the expectations of the job, the expectations of your education and all of that stuff and then decide is this dress appropriate for this interview for this position and have the students write their their opinions 
after you've already discussed the importance of looking the part for, you know, had your little whatever uh, direct instruction and then have them go around with sticky notes to the different places, looking at the job description and thinking about the principles that you discussed about how it's important to present yourself in a particular way and have them comment on that and then bring it back to the class and decide of the six different stations that you went to, which one would you based on looks alone based on looks alone, would you hire? And the students are going to undoubtedly say like, oh, a particular one. Then you can go in and give the background of each of the people like, or you could have it there in the gallery, say like this person that's dressed like a bum has two master's degrees and all that stuff. And then you could talk about like, well, so yeah, he's, he's awesome for the job, but look how he came to the interview. What would that yeah. say to the people? <laughs> you know, and so, right. That has them talking, speaking, listening, and don't, don't, Think about limitations like, oh, I wouldn't be able to do this in my class because it'd be too hard. No, 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 no. Pretend. Remember, this is a theoretical exam. In theory, you have all the resources. You make it up. Oh, I have these robots and they're going to come into that. Like, I, you know, it is a free for all as far as what you're able to make up that you're going to do with your students. Um, but it should hit each of these points. Yes. As long as we do all those points, we'll be good, right? Absolutely. And staying Absolutely. on topic. Remember. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. That's good to know. I'm going to be praying for you on Saturday. I have a PPR class Thank on you. Saturday. You're welcome to come to it, Miss Gabby, the traditional mm -hmm. PPR class. I invite all of my trade people because most of your exam is pedagogy. And, and the difference is that uh, the other content areas, they have to take their content exam separate and then they have to take just the PPR exam. And so every Wednesday night and every Saturday morning, uh, Wednesday evening and Saturday morning, I have traditional PPR class. And, and I and I, it's not just for the main, the traditional PPR exam. It's just about pedagogy. We literally just talk about the practice of pedagogy, like how to do things best for the diverse populations that we have. Nice. And at what time are uh, on Saturdays and on Wednesdays? So on Wednesday night, it's at 630 from 630 to 730. Mm -hmm. And then every Saturday morning, we do pedagogy class at 11 from 11 to 1230. And Saturdays, we usually like, you know, have more detailed discussions. And like, maybe we'll watch a little video, like I had them watch a particular documentary on Netflix. And then we had a whole discussion about it. And, and um, so I definitely encourage you to come, you know, we have a, we have yeah, a good time. I have a little church, um, that, that we're supposed to go to. So I'll, uh, I can't promise this, this Saturday, but oh, no, no, no. yeah, it doesn't have to be this Saturday. You just, I'm saying like whatever Saturday you have available, just jump on in and then, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Do, do you send like an invite as well? Or, or like you did with, uh, this one, like you send me through email, like the link for the zoom it's through zoom as well. It is through Zoom. Um, so I have my Calendly where you can sign up for it and, and sign up for whatever individual Saturday you want. But if you if you didn't sign up and you just were like Saturday morning, Miss I'll say that I can come today, like I'll just send you the email real quick, like right before class. Okay. Okay, perfect. Sounds good. All right. You guys have a beautiful rest of your weekend. It's gonna start today. So have a good weekend and um I, Thank you. I'm going to be thinking about you. I'm going to prende la vela here. And you you know what to do. Remember, yeah. give them exactly what they're at. Don't give them more. Don't give them two learning objectives or two different things to do. Choose one. One yes, thing to yes. focus on and really delve deep in it. Remember, it's just one day. You're not going to teach them everything about workplace ethics in one day. Choose one. One particular thing. How about one topic? Huh? One topic only? Is that Yes, choose one and then go deeply into it. That's correct. One objective. Okay, uh, good to know. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. It's my pleasure. Let me know how you do. And um, yes, I will. What are you thinking about you? You're taking that at nine a.m. Uh, I'm supposed to be at ten. Be there oh, at ten. Okay. Thank well, you, ma'am. Appreciate group it. Prayer for you at eleven with my Saturday class. We'll just be mm -hmm. like, let him get all the right answers. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Nice. Bye. -bye. Bye. Good luck. Bye, guys. Thank Good you, luck, Mr. Espinosa. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye. Bye.